Well, good morning, Lionhearts. Your old pal, Jordan the Lion. Hope you guys are doing well. Well, I want to give you a little heads up on today's vlog. This might be something that you want to censor for younger kids or maybe even you. Today we're going to talk about the Wonderland murders. I'm going to show you the two houses associated with that story, but really, I can't really do the story without telling you basically a biography or the backstory on the porn star John Holmes, the man who I feel is directly responsible for this entire incident. Now in almost every case, I pride myself on trying to give an even-handed, fair representation of every story, but in this case, even though in the end John Holmes was exonerated, you know, I had seen so many documentaries on this guy, I've seen so many interviews with people that either worked with him, managed him, were friends with him, that, you know, I really can't do that. This all falls 100% on his head, and that's the only way I can tell this story. And there's our buddy, right there. Yep, he can care less about the Wonderland murders. Now in the 70s when the adult film industry was really taking off and kind of burgeoning, I guess you would say, it became a big talk because there, there started to be lawsuits coming out about indecency. And so a lot of this went to court and in the end it was found that it's First Amendment that they could make these films. Now John Holmes had an attribute that was made him well known, let's say. And because of this, he ended up becoming the face of the porn industry for quite a while. And because of that, he ended up doing things that I feel foreshadow his personality and what he would end up doing years later that would result in four deaths and almost a fifth in July of 1981. Now John Holmes became well known in the adult industry for a character he played called Johnny Wad. And if you've ever seen uh, Boogie Nights, that's who Boogie Nights was based off of. So he played this detective, this private eye type character, and because of his involvement in the adult industry, John Holmes was pretty quickly targeted by the police. Uh, they were looking for ways of busting people, exposing people in the industry, so the first person they came after was him. He immediately was willing to roll over and became basically an informant. He believed he was Johnny Wad, and that became a big problem with John Holmes. Everyone that knew him said he was a manic liar, and he would make up so many stories, or so many stories would be told about him, that he couldn't differentiate what actually happened and what was real. Look at you. John Holmes' behavior had nothing to do with drugs or alcohol initially. He grew up uh, with an abusive father when he was a kid who used to beat the living tar out of him. So at the age of 16, John actually struck back to this alcoholic. I mean, apparently the guy was just an, a totally abusive drunk to where they said it, uh, John's full memory was either being beaten or seeing his stepfather falling all over furniture. Um, so he ends up lashing out, beating up his stepfather, hiding out, and at the age of 16 telling his mom, you have to sign me into the military. He went into the military, and so for the rest of his life, he claimed he was never a drinker or someone who abused uh, drugs or anything like that. But people that were involved with him and knew him said, yeah, originally that was true, but three or four years into the business and it was pretty clear he had become a cocaine addict. I see my dog over there rolling around on his back. That's never a good sign. Somebody that was here recently told me the reason that dogs do that is they try and mask their scent by their predator's scent. Apparently that's what it's all about. This is uncalled for. So John had become an informant for the police department, exposing his friends, telling them who was gonna be at what shoot, where the van was gonna pick people up, where they were gonna shoot, who was involved, who was funding it, things like that. And like I said, he believed he was Johnny Wad. And he would turn in all of his friends, and then when people, you know, eventually would confront him about it, he said, hey, they're scum, they're trash, which 
just went to prove that that experience when he was a kid left him with basically no empathy for other people. He would, this would actually become part of the case at Wonderland. He would have no remorse for those people that were murdered. So with John being the most famous adult film star in the world, he also had a massive drug habit that he couldn't support. Even making $1,000 a day, he couldn't support this habit and would resort to, well first he, even though he had a wife, he would resort to uh, taking a 15 year old mistress when he was in his 30s and then when he didn't have money for drugs, he would pimp her. He would offer her to the people he got his drugs from, mainly uh, entrepreneur Eddie Nash, a man who would end up becoming involved and also be part of the Wonderland murders. But he's a guy that the police department said they had always had their eye on. He was known for arsons, drug running, burglaries. So as soon as the Wonderland murders happened, they pretty much knew who exactly was involved. Now John became a drug mule and that's basically what ends up creating this scenario. He ends up getting himself so far in debt with people that he either needs to get drugs from or owes money to that that creates what ends up happening with the murders of July 1st. First we're going to go to Eddie Nash's house. That's the very first part of this story that leads to Wonderland. John never trusted anyone and people that said he could be the nicest guy ever on a set also would say he never considered you a friend. He, you know, basically had a massive ego and that's what allowed him to keep working why he would act the way he did. And they said on sets he eventually would develop such a drug problem he couldn't perform. He would just close down the set and say, I refuse to work today. Or they couldn't find him all day and would find him cowering in a closet doing drugs. So now you had a man who was a pathological liar, a drug addict, and someone who appeared to have no empathy for other people. Pretty dangerous combination that led to this night. There was your obligatory uh, pee shot. Now Eddie Nash was a businessman who had worked his way up from nothing, owned a club called the Starwood, and like I said, he was a well-known drug dealer. We're going to head off to Eddie Nash's house here in a little bit. Like I said, I always try and keep a pretty even story if I can where I don't really blame anyone. But in the end, every interview you ever see about John Holmes, everybody that was ever on his side eventually thought he was... just thought he was his wife. His wife said, you're evil. He was evil and she had to get rid of, get him out of her life. So the day before the Wonderland murders, this right here was Eddie Nash's house. John Holmes convinced the people that lived in the Wonderland house to do a robbery here. He said that there was lots of drugs and lots of money here. He said he would come here earlier in the day, make up a reason. He would leave the sliding glass door unlocked and then they could all enter later and do the robbery, which is exactly what happened. This is also the house that John Holmes would have given his teenage girlfriend over to Eddie Nash who would abuse her, obviously. So it was right here that after the murders happened, they would come and they would arrest Eddie Nash right at this, right at this house. So as soon as the, and I believe Eddie Nash was actually here when they did the robbery, which made him even madder, it was a sign of disrespect. So he was out to teach these people a lesson. And so what he did was he knew, put two and two together, John had been there earlier in the day they came in through the sliding glass door, so he immediately went looking for John Holmes. John's girlfriend said they were actually stopped at like a gas station or something. John went out to go get something and when he came back in the car, the moment he sat down in the car, a gun was pointed at his head, told him, you're going to help me get exact revenge basically. So wasting no time that night. John Holmes led three men over to the Wonderland house and helped them gain access into the house. So in the robberies at Eddie Nash's house, no one was killed and it basically went according to plan. 
They got the drugs, they got the money, and it was all to be split amongst the people that lived in the house and John Holmes. All right, we're headed up Lookout Mountain. Well, here it is, the famous Wonderland house. Looks much different these days. I actually dated a girl who used to live here. She said, never felt that it was haunted. She said she actually loved it. She said it was a really great, reasonable price for the neighborhood. So basically what happened was three men showed up here. John Holmes led them up this stairway right there. He buzzed to be let in. He knew the people there. They buzzed him in and his story was that two out of the three men did the beating and then one man, man hold, held him up against a wall and made him watch all this, but that's not true. He, you know, they say there were handprints and everything. But they found his handprint here around the house. He actually went up those stairs. They went in and everything. And uh, so this is where it all happened. There was a body found here. There was two on the top floor and one on the other. One person lived and they said this was a pretty party house. So even though they were close houses, they heard them. They just said that they, um, they had heard noise before and so they never thought anything of it. So that's the house. The one woman who managed to survive, they said she actually survived because they had crushed her skull and it trapped the blood in, somehow keeping her alive. And the next day when a worker was next door working, he heard her moaning. John Holmes was apprehended, questioned. They let him go, then he went on the run, traveled, they said basically had a National Lampoon vacation, went, hit all the sites from California basically to Florida, and then they apprehended him there where his uh, girlfriend turned him in. He went to trial and was found not guilty. They said even though they found his handprints, there was no proof that he committed any of the murders. You may or may not have noticed that the homeowner at the Wonderland house was outside yelling at me the whole time I was filming, but that comes with the territory. I wasn't breaking any laws. I was standing in the street, so that's the price you pay when you live in a famous home. I'm sure she deals with it all the time, but she just kept looking at me going, ugh, get out of here, get out of here. When they apprehended John in Florida and brought him back here, the first person he called was his first wife. And uh, she said, do you feel any remorse for what you've done? Or what's going on? He said, they were scum. It was either them or me. What a crazy story, huh? John Holmes eventually went back to doing pornography and eventually died of AIDS. Wow, check out that house. Now the Wonder that murder case became highly touted in the media because not only did it have a main focal character that was so well known that he was pretty much the butt of a joke in most cases, but it was the first case to set a precedent by um, allowing the footage that they had filmed of the walkthrough after the murder to be admissible in court. That bloody crime scene was actually admissible in court for, uh, for the jury to see. Someday we'll come out here and vlog Mount Olympus. They have some of the nicest homes in Hollywood. After being up in Montecito and seeing all those slides, I'm not sure I would want to live in a house there or have a house built up there. Now when the Wonderland gang went to perpetrate that robbery on Eddie Nash, they did actually shoot his bodyguard, which is a big part of why he wanted to exact revenge. But if you remember Scott Thorson in the Liberace vlog, he was Liberace's boyfriend for six years, Scott Thorson later said that he was at Eddie's, Eddie Nash's house to buy drugs the night that they had found John Holmes and brought him back to the house. Scott Thorson said that he saw John Holmes uh, strapped to a chair and punched and beated repeatedly until he divulged who had done the, the break-in or who he had helped do the break-in. Interesting little connection there, huh? Well, I just came home and had a package sitting outside the door for Jolly. <laughs> it's a front dog carrier, like a doggy Bjorn. Huh. Couldn't find a note attached, so whoever sent it, thank you. I'm, I wonder if it was my mom. It's very possible she would have done something crazy like that. But whoever it was, thank you. Well guys, I think it's about that time. 
I want to thank Diane, Kevin, Frank Bennett, and Patty Sullivan for making donations to my channel. I think we should wrap this vlog up. What do you say? Well, like I said, guys, that's it. In the end, the Wonderland murders went unpunished. Everyone that was tried was acquitted. And even when John Holmes was on his deathbed in the VA hospital, they came to interview him a month before he died, and he still told him nothing. He was pretty much incoherent at that time, but took the secret to his grave as to what happened. Now, his first wife at the time said he did come over right after the murders and said that he had been a witness to a murder and that he was bloody and asked if he could come in and take a shower and take a nap, and she said she allowed him to and just thought about, how do I get this guy out of here? And once he left, she never let him come back. Weird story. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you for watching. A lot of people had requested over time for me to go tell the story of the Wonderland murders. And today was that day. Have a great night. We'll see you all tomorrow. Goodbye.